Christ in our mind, we'd love to invite you to sing along with us. You called my name and I woke up Cause death is dead, my life has just begun Came out of that grave and met the one Who's rewriting my story Now I'm walking in your freedom Your resurrection power lives in me And it's all because of Jesus My heart is beating and I've come alive, come alive out there all right I know that you lost an hour of sleep so did I <laughs> but we want to teach you a brand new song and I'm gonna teach you part of it and I'm gonna ask you to sing along with me all right it goes like this let it be no one let it be no one let it be no one shout it from the rooftops from the rooftops that's it all right you ready to try it together? Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. Let it be no one. Let it be no one. Let it be no one. Shout it from the rooftops. From the one more time, come on. Let it be no one. Let it be no one. And let
originally from Oahu, Hawaii. Um, I came here at the beginning of COVID, so beginning of 2020. Uh, things kind of happened. Uh, things got removed from my life and then started serving at Central and haven't stopped since. So. Hawaii is such a small island that it kind of gets claustrophobic in a way, uh, where everybody knows each other. You don't feel like you're growing much. Um, and I felt very stagnant. I was kind of lost and just didn't know where to go in a way. And Vegas just kind of made, made the most sense because my family was up here. Grew up in a small private Christian school. Um, grew up with church being a part of the routine. With that, it was very repetitive in a way. Um, my heart wasn't really in it. I knew the concept of God. I, didn't, I knew it as a religion and not a relationship. At the end of my sophomore year, I got into a relationship and the relationship was good, it started off great, um, but I had no basis of what godly dating and uh, dating in the Christian way looked like. And my whole identity was in that relationship. I valued it to such a high standard. I put it above my family and my friends. And when it was taken away from me, I was just kind of lost and didn't know what to do because my world was in that relationship. In school, my favorite parable was the wise man building his house on the rock. And um, looking at what my rock was, it was that relationship. And once it was taken away, I felt God's immediate pull on my heart to come back to Him. Um, I realized that I put something above God and it wasn't gonna last. When I first came to Central, it was honestly overwhelming. This was huge. This is a big church. Um, it was a lot, um, but like seeing the production and seeing how much they put into it to bring people to Christ, it drew my attention. Um, and then with that, I decided to take the step to, to dig into it more and start serving. C CY has been one of the biggest and most like influential high school groups that I've ever seen from a church. I have so much experience with not taking God seriously throughout high school. Um, and I made my fair share of mistakes that 
I can't go back and change. I can't. I can look back at the past and I can learn from it though. And I can ask God to teach me what He wanted to teach me through that. Um, and I can help students through that and seeing them navigate those type of issues and, and knowing that I was in their shoes before, um, it makes me empathetic. You know, it, it, yeah, it grows my heart in a way um, to want to sit down with them and walk through life with them. And it just in inspires me to abide with Christ more, pretty much to, to walk the walk with Him even more so that I can use my testimony to help other students and to take God seriously because I know how much of a blessing my life has been from walking with Him, my life BC, to, to walking with Him now, so. I would have to say that our plan is not our own plan um, and that God's plan is above ours. Um, and we just need to take, we need to have the courage to take the next step into His plan or else we won't be able to see what He has planned for our life. I love that. One of my favorite things about this church is just experiencing people's life change, hearing their story, literally by the thousands. I'm grateful for every one of them. And you know, you and I get to share in those experiences through our generosity of our time, our talent, and our financial resources. When we give in that way, when we're generous, God takes our generosity and he touches this world with it. He changes lives with it. Are you with me, church? That's what he does through our generosity. And we get to participate in that. If you'd like to financially support our ministry, it's easy to do. Go to central.family or centralchurch.online or right after our experience, you can find an usher in our lobby or a generosity team member. And there you can give by debit or credit card. But every gift you give, every dollar you give goes to rescue people and provide hope to a world that desperately needs to know hope. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for making a huge difference in so many people's lives. Hey, anybody want to experience God's love this weekend? I mean, did you come to say, God, I really want to experience your love? Well, let's go to God in prayer and ask him to do just that before we worship him. Would you join me? Well, Jesus, we come to you humbly, humbly, knowing that you're here. You promise in your word, Jesus, where two or three are gathered in your name, in your name. You'll be in the midst. And we know that you're here because we're gathering in your name. So we come to you with an open heart. We pray that we would experience your love. We pray that through that love, it would give us patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. That you would draw us unto yourself as we seek you with all of our heart. And in exchange, Jesus, we pray that you would wrap your arms of love about us and that we would feel that embrace in our life deep into our soul and that we would know that we've met with you, a life-changing God, a loving God who desperately desires to be in a relationship with each and every one of us. I pray during this time, Jesus, we could set aside anything in our life that hinders us from fully coming to you and that we would open our hearts completely to you. And as you work and move, we'll give you all of the praise and honor and credit for what's done here this morning. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't breathe. It. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. If you believe that, just sing it. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord Come on I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord Oh, oh, oh. 
take someone's addictions, their fear, their anxiety, their worry, their sickness, their depression, and he's gonna turn it into good. We just gotta keep looking up to him. Come on, let's declare this today. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. victory no matter what you're faced with but I can just say a prayer over your life today would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air and if you're next to somebody with their hand raised I want to encourage you to stretch a hand out towards them let's just pray let's ask God to do what only he can do God right now we lift up our friends to you many of us will never understand the pain the circumstances we're faced with but Lord I pray in this very moment that you would remind us that you have not forgotten about us and that you know every detail of our story. And if you've been faithful in our past and you're faithful to us today, how much more faithful will you be tomorrow? So God, we depend on you, not our own understanding. And we place our trust and our faith in the outcome that you wanna see happen in our lives. For it's in your name we pray and everybody said together. I grew up in, in church, not, not much like Central with the cool lights and awesome band that we have back here, but uh, we had the orchestra and the choir and we sang a lot of great hymns together growing up. And one of the songs that we sang was called It Is Well. And it was written by an author who uh, not only lost his home in the Chicago fire, it was years later his family was out on the ocean and the vessel they were on sunk and he lost his entire family in about the same place when he was on another vessel where his family had gone down, he wrote these amazing words that I wanna to sing together today. It goes like this. When peace like a river 
attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll
an incredible time of worship and those new songs. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited uh, for all the new music that Central Live is coming out with. Well, we want to welcome all of you and all of our central locations, especially that Sunrise Mountain location. We also have people joining us online. So shout out to Jennifer from Arkansas, Kathy from Panama, Celia and Robert watching from Monterey, California, and Lorenzo watching from Europe. We are all around the world. Oh, it is all around the world. Yes. I love seeing the Central family represented. Yes. Everywhere, global. Hey, also we want to give a shout out to all of our Central family, the men and women watching inside prison facilities through our partnership with God Behind Bars and the Pando app. We are so glad that you're here this weekend as well. And it's that time, no matter where you're watching from, we're going to throw it to Pastor Judd, who's going to tell us what we're in store for this weekend. All right, welcome everybody. Time change weekend. Got nothing on you guys. You're amazing. Well done. Thank you for being here. Hey, we have a special family member who is speaking this weekend. I'm no longer going to talk about this person as a guest speaker because they have been around so long. They're really just an extended part of our family. And that is Pastor Herbert Cooper. Come on. The last 15 years, uh, if you've been around Central, then you've heard Pastor Cooper again and again. He's an amazing communicator. Pastors People's Church in Oklahoma City, one of my closest friends. He's been a dear friend to Central and the Central family, and their church has supported us through, you know, all the ups and downs over over many years with prayer and encouragement, and they're just uh, amazing, he and his family. And it is time change weekend, and it's spring break, and it's still early, so, you know, what makes a communicator better is a lively, hungry, energetic audience listening and leaning in, all right? You know, if it's appropriate, putting your hands together, we're a clapping church. And uh, if it's funny, laughing, you know, things like that. But let's give some energy back to Pastor Herbert this morning. He's traveled a long way to be here. It's a great message. Let's welcome Pastor Herbert Cooper. What's up, Central? You doing, you doing okay today? Yeah. Oh, it's so good to be here. I just love this place. It really is home away from home. I really do feel uh, like family and love your pastors. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were hanging out together, uh, me and my wife and Pastor Judd and Pastor Lori just hanging out, and we laughed so hard. I don't, remember, I don't remember what we were laughing about, but we laughed so hard, I almost fell out of my chair. I, I mean, I doubled over. It was, you know, you got to have friends like that that just you laugh with, you can hang with, you can just be real with. And though, there are those, those kinds of friends for us, and I love their integrity. I love their wisdom, and I love just what God is doing around here at Central. And can I say this to you, Central? Man, your best days are ahead of you. Do you believe that? Come on, can we give it up for Pastor Judd, Pastor Lori? Come on, give it up for all the staff. Come on, give it up for all of the staff today. Wow. Well, I have my girlfriend with me this weekend, my baby mama, my sweet thing, the hot sauce on my chitlins and the gravy on my biscuits. She's with me. Uh, my, my wife of 25 years, and my, I love her so much. And We left them four kids at home, but we're together, so. Well, I'm excited to share with you uh, today, and uh, it was a little over a month ago, the Super Bowl, and, uh, you know, me and, and Pastor Judd, we have something very much in common, and that is we are both Dallas Cowboys fans, and, and that means we've been in depression for the last 30 years, but... Um, uh, we're trying to console each other and trying to make it through every single Super Bowl. But this past Super Bowl a month ago, it was the Chiefs versus the Eagles. And 
I was going for the Eagles because I like Jalen Hurts. He played at the Oklahoma Sooners for a year, so I was going for the Eagles. And they played at the State Farm Stadium there in Arizona. And maybe you heard the story. There was there was a man there, a fan, a diehard fan, and he noticed there was an empty seat next to a man, and he just kind of stared at the man. And, and so the man looked back at him, and he said, well, uh, man, uh, I, 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 I'm here, and there's an empty seat here next to me. And, and the man said, well, what's up with that? Why, why, why would you have an empty seat next to you? What, what's going on? And he said, well, man, my, my, my wife died, and, and this was her seat. And he said, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry to hear this. And he said, I'm just shocked. I'm really surprised that one of your family members or one of your friends didn't want to take her seat and come to the biggest game of the year. And he said, man, I'm surprised as well. They, they insisted on going to the funeral. And uh, <laughs> some of you will get it later. You, some of some of you are slow. <laughs> we, 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 we can become so focused on ourselves that we can forget what really matters in life. We, we, we love to focus on ourselves. We love to put ourselves first. You know, you know e e even as little kids, I, you know, I, I remember as a little kid, we'd go to PE class, and at PE class, man, we, we would be at PE class, and I would always want to be first in the race. They would line us all up, and you'd run, and, and I would want to be first. I don't want to be second. I was running with all my might to be first place, and, and I, I can remember growing up and playing baseball and, and soccer and football and basketball, and I always wanted to be on the first team. I didn't want to be on the second team. I worked really hard to try to always be on the first team. We, we just love being first. I, even my kids, when they were a lot smaller, they used to race to the car to see who could be first. It was like a game. I'm going to be first. And they would race to get to the car first. And I thought that was so cute and so adorable watching my kids. And then I realized us adults do the same thing. Come on, who's like me? I'm driving in my car, and I'm, I'm pulling, and I see the light up ahead, and, and somebody pulls out from behind me, and they're trying to get ahead of me to be first at the light, and they speed up, and I just speed up too. They speed, and I speed up too. And in Oklahoma, I look at them, and I hope they don't go to my church, because I am going to be first to the light. Whenever me and my family pay, play board games, we play card games, and I don't play for fun. <laughs> yeah, baby, I play for first place. Yeah, I'm trying to win this thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, even at the grocery store, I got a problem, because at the grocery store, I'm always looking to see which line's the shortest. And then I will notice, oh, three hours over, there's only one person in the line, they're about to check out, come on, who's like me? I am going to get to that line first. I see you trying to get there. They call me long-legged Cooper. I am going to be first place. We, we, we believe our life is better when we're first. And then Jesus shows up on the scene 2,000 years ago. And he says, hey, if you really want to be first place in life, if you really want to win in life, like, like if you really want a blessed life, you don't put you first, you put God first. Today, I want to teach from a very familiar and famous portion of Scripture, and I want to shed some fresh insight on this Scripture to help you in your spiritual journey. It's Matthew chapter six and verse 33. It says, seek, come on everybody, shout seek. seek. Yeah, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And the greatest regrets of our life have happened because we've sought after the wrong things. And we sought after some wrong things and, and they did not deliver what we thought they would deliver and we woke up and we had pain, heartache, 
broken relationships and regret after regret. Maybe you're in that season of life right now and you're seeking after some wrong things. Maybe you're seeking after love in all the wrong places and it's not delivering what you thought it would deliver. And instead you're getting pain, heartache, broken relationships, regret after regret. Maybe, maybe you're seeking with all of your heart, just seeking after more money and, and more possessions and thinking, man, that's just the answer and it's not delivering what you thought it would. And instead, you're just getting more pain and more heartache and more broken relationships and regret after regret. Maybe, maybe you're seeking after just pleasure. If I can just get more pleasure, if I can just make myself happy, things will be so much better. And it's not delivering what you thought it would deliver. Instead, it's delivering pain and, and a heartache and broken relationships and regret after regret. And Jesus said, hey, gang, hey, 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 Christ followers. I don't want you to live with regret after regret. So don't live like you don't know God. And, and, and Jesus simply says, don't put you first. And in the scripture right before verse 33 and verse 33, 32, Jesus gives us some important context. And he says this in verse 32, for the Gentiles, or well, that would be the pagans or, or those who don't know God, they seek, they seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. And he says, those who don't know God, they seek after the money and the car and the thrill and the pleasure and the power and the popularity. And it ends with pain and and heartbreak and broken relationships and regret after regret. And Jesus says, I know you need those things. I, I know you need the money and I, I know you need the relationships and, and I know you need the food and, and I know you need the, the car and the clothes. Like I know you need those things and so don't live like you don't know. God, what I want you to do is to seek first my kingdom and all these other things will be given to you as well. But it's God first, not you first. God first, not you first. I, what I want to do today is I want to give you three truths I wish I would have known about putting God first. I wish I could back up 30, 35 years ago, and I wish I could talk to my younger self and say, Herbert, You've got to understand these, tr these truths about putting God first. Because if you will put these truths into practice in your life, it's going to save you from so much heartache. It's going to save you from so much regret in your life. Let me share with you these three truths I wish I would have known. And the first is this. I wish I would have known that everything is more spiritual than I realize. You see, before Jesus said, seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. He was talking to people who were worrying about everything. I mean, they were concerned and worried about everything in life and they were seeking after all of these things. And Jesus was teaching how the spiritual and how the natural are connected. Most people don't understand this. A lot of people ignore this verse because this verse does not make any sense to them because they're thinking, man, I need the car. You see, I need the relationship. I need the home. I, I need the business deal to go through. through. So I, I need to make it happen. What, what does Jesus mean? Seek first the kingdom of God. No, I've got to make this thing happen. So people try to make dating happen on their own. They try to make marriage happen on their own. They, they try to make parenting happen on their own. They try to make career and they try to make life's more, most important decisions happen on their own. Own, and they don't realize what Jesus is teaching here, that the natural and the spiritual are connected. So, so seek first God's kingdom. And if you do, everything's more spiritual than you realize. When you seek first God's kingdom, all these other things will be added to your life as well. 
everything is more spiritual than you realize. But Paul talks about this principle in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. He says, for our struggle, and you just list your struggle right now, whatever struggle you're facing in life. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle is not against people. We're not wrestling, we're not fighting against people. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. Well, pastor, you just don't know the people in my life. And I hear you. I know what you're saying. But Paul is simply trying to draw our attention to a principle that it's more spiritual than you realize. The marriage struggle is more spiritual than you realize. The struggle with your child is more spiritual than you realize. The financial struggle is more spiritual than you realize. The struggle maybe at work or at school or in the dating relationship, in your health, in your friendship, it's more spiritual than you realize. You're in a spiritual battle. Paul's not trying to say that there's a demon behind every tree, but he is trying to say you're in a spiritual battle. You're in a fight. You're in a war. You say, well, what do I do if I'm in a spiritual battle? If everything's more spiritual than I realize, what do I do? Well, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number three, he says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. So we live in this world, but if we're going to win the battles of life, we can't fight the way the world fights. And he goes on to say in verse four, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Paul says, don't view your life, don't view your problems the way the world does. It's more spiritual then you realize don't fight like the world fights. You and I are in a spiritual battle and we've got to use spiritual weapons. That's why when we come to church every single weekend, man, when the worship team is leading us, we can't be disengaged and playing on our phones. Oh no, man, I'm in a spiritual battle. I got to worship Jesus. So man, I lift my hands and I, I praise God because I'm in a spiritual battle and I need spiritual weapons. And when Pastor Judd or, or Pastor Nick or another the communicators teaching God's word. I mean, I can't be dozing off and dazing off. No, I've got to be locked in. I've got to take some notes. I've got to be dialed in because, man, I need some spiritual principles. I need strategies to fight the battles of life. So I'm dialed into the word of God. And that's why I pray. And that's why I read God's word. And that's why I tithe. And that's why I serve. I'm in a spiritual battle. That's why I love my enemies. That's why I forgive those who hurt me. Why? I'm in a spiritual battle and it takes spiritual weapons to win seek first my kingdom and all these other things will be added to you as well number two is this the second truth is I wish I would have known that it would be my best year ever if it was my best year spiritually Jesus said, seek me first, and all these other things will be given to you as well. But here's what most people think. It will be my best year ever if I can just get the home. It'll be my best year ever if I can just get the car. It'll be my best year ever if I can get the dream job. Oh, it'll be my best year ever if these kids quit acting crazy. It'll be my best year ever if my spouse would stop being an idiot and my marriage would turn around. It'll be my best year ever. So a lot of people spend all their time and all their attention and all their affections seeking after all these things. And Jesus said, hey, 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 no, seek me first. You want to have your best year ever? Seek me first. And all these other things will be added to you as well. But you have to seek my kingdom over your kingdom. You have to seek my way over your way. You have to seek my will over your will. You have to seek to follow what I want over what you 
want. You know, I grew up in Oklahoma, and football is really, really big in our state. And, and you know, when I was growing up, I played a lot of different positions. And, but when I got to high school, my freshman, sophomore, and junior year, I played a lot of wide receiver. And I'd run out and catch the ball from the quarterback. And although my senior year, they decided to move me to running back because the two running backs had graduated. I was a senior now, and they needed some running back, so they moved me to the running back position, and I had to learn all the running back plays. And at the beginning of the season, we're scrimmaging, we're having all of these practices, and there was one play. It was called a counter play. And on the counter play, I would step one way when the ball was hiked, and then I would come back this way and get the ball and run through the hole. And I hated this play. Because I would step, turn, I'd get the ball, and I'd run in the hole, and the linebacker would kill me <laughs> every play. Coach called counter. I'm like, I, I hate it. This is stupid. <laughs> Coach said, Cooper, run the play like I told you to run it. I am. No, you're not. He said, listen, Cooper, I'm telling you, when you step, the guard is pulling. Wait for the guard to pull. And the guard goes through the hole, and the guard blocks the linebacker. Shazam. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I've been running the play my way. And I scored so many touchdowns. Go ahead, big boy. Go ahead. Man, I scored some touchdowns my senior year, falling that big old boy through the hole because I began to run the play the way the coach designed the play. And can I tell you, God has spiritual plays. And if you will run the play the way God has designed the play to run, your life will go so much smoother. But you got to run the play the way God designed it. And I want to give you four spiritual plays today. Four spiritual plays. If you will run the play, I'm going to ask you this. Would you commit for one year, just the next 12 months? Today, would you commit the next 12 months to run these four spiritual plays? And I'm telling you, it'll be your best year ever, if it's your best year spiritually. Here's play one. Play one. Faithfully pray and read God's word. Just, just every day, just faithfully pray and read God's word. Just give God the first 15 minutes of your day. I know some of you already do that. You're giving God 30 minutes or 45 minutes, but, but, but everybody can give God 15 minutes, just five minutes of prayer. And I have a prayer list. It's on my phone that I pray through almost every single morning. And to just make, maybe write down 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 things and just pray through it for five minutes. And then, and then spend five minutes reading the Bible. Maybe you want to start with Proverbs or start with the book of Psalms or start with the book of John. But just, just, just spend five minutes in God's word and then five minutes in worship. Here, listen, let me make it easy for you. Just find your favorite Christian song. Most of them are about four to five minutes long. And just, just hit play like right there on your phone. And just worship for five minutes. Say, God, I love you, and, and I worship you, and sing the words to the song, and, and just, just, just five minutes of prayer, Bible, worship, prayer, Bible, worship. Just run, one year, run the spiritual play and watch God work in your life. Here's the second, here's the second play, the second play. Worship in God's house faithfully. Worship in God's house faithfully. Psalm chapter 84, verse 10 says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God, in the church of God, than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Better is one day in God's church than a thousand elsewhere. I love God's house. There's nothing like God's house. I met my wife. We've been married 25 years, about 26 and a half years ago, I met her in the lobby of a chapel 
before we went to worship the Lord. And then we dated in God's house. We got married in God's house. All of our children got dedicated to God in God's house. They all got water baptized in God's house. I've met my best friends in God's house. When my dad died last year and I was going through a difficult season, it was going to God's house and being with God's people that lifted me out of that pit. When I've been depressed, it's been coming to God's house and worshiping God. There's many times that God's delivered me and he said, me free. I love the house of God. I understand what the psalmist means. Better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. And maybe today you're thinking to yourself, well, good for you. I'd rather be at the hockey game. I want to ask you to do something. Would you pray for God to give you a passion for his house? If you don't have one, just just pray that simple prayer. God, give me a passion to attend church every single weekend. The psalmist said in Psalm 69, verse 9, passion for your house has consumed me. Pray, God, give me a passion for your house. Give me a passion to worship with your people. Give me a passion to get out of bed every single weekend and to come worship and to hear the teaching and the preaching of your word because better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. Here's what I want us to do. I I I want us all to do this together right now. Here we go. Here's the little exercise I want us to do. Because I want all of us to run the spiritual play. Because if you do, it'll be your best year ever. Right now, I want you to decide how many weekends are you going to attend church over the next year? Come on, I want you to think about that. Maybe for some of you, like, well, Pastor, you know, we got vacation and all. and So about 45. Or, or, or maybe for some of you, you know, it's not only vacation, but, you know, kids get sick. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to have to miss about 12 weekends. So I'm going to attend 40 weekends this year. I'm going to make God's house a priority. I'm going to run the spiritual play. If you will run the spiritual play, when I come back to preach next year, you're going to try to find me and kiss me on my forehead and thank me for helping you have your best year ever. I'm telling you, run the spiritual play. Let me give you a third play. Let me give you a third play, a third spiritual play, and that is this. Give your life away by serving others faithfully. Give your life away. Serve others faithfully. Get get to a first step. Next weekend here at Central, we've got first step. Next weekend, in person, online, you can go to central.family, sign up for first step, or go out in the lobby, get get to first step, get to first step, and then get on a volunteer team. Like, give your life away. Serve others faithfully and watch it be your best year ever. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Gandhi said, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself serving others. Just run the spiritual play the next 12 months. And watch what God does in your life. Here's the fourth play, and that is grow closer to God and others by attending a small group faithfully. Grow closer to God and others by attending a small group faithfully. Spiritual growth happens best in circles, not in rows. And your life will be transformed if you'll find a small group here at Central and get connected with some other like-minded Christ followers. Spiritual growth happens best in community, not in isolation. The next 12 months, would you run those four spiritual plays? I realize some of you don't remember what I just said. Get your phone out, get your phone out and get a picture of this. Come on, get your phone out. Come on, get your phone out. You got to, tw- for, for one year, run the spiritual play. I'm asking, come on, get a picture, get a picture. For one year, run the spiritual play. And in 12 months, I want you to come tell me, is your life better? Because here's what I know. It'll be your best year ever if it's your best year spiritually. <laughs> number three. Number three. Number three. Number three. I wish 
I would have gone all in with Jesus sooner. I wish I would have known this. I wish I would have gone all in with Jesus sooner. You say, I played a lot of games with God. Junior high, high school, running wild, having sex, lying, cheating, pornography. Just, I, was just, I was out there. And I, I knew about church. Went to church some as a kid. I knew about Jesus. I knew about the Bible. But I just I wasn't trying to go all in with God. And going all in with God means seeking first his kingdom. It's, it's, it, God wants to be first. He doesn't want some of you or three-fourths of you. He wants all of you. H- how many of you remember singing the song, Hokey Pokey? Anybody remember that song? Anybody remember that? Come on, come on. Put your right foot in, put your right foot out, put your right foot in, and shake it all about. Do the hokey pokey and turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. Come on, come on. Come on, everybody, everybody. Every, everybody online, every campus. Come on, sing with Pastor Herbert today. Come on, everybody. Put your right foot in. Put your right foot out. Put your right foot in and shake it all about. Do the hokey Hey! Some of you got a hokey pokey faith. I put my kids in, I put my marriage out, I put my car in, I put my job out, I put my friendships in, I put my anger out, I put my Sunday morning in and my Friday nights out. That's what it's... I mean, you know, God, 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 you know, you know, I, I you know, I, I pray every once in a while. You, my right foot's in. God, God, you, I come to church, you know, every once in a while. God, God, you know, I don't cuss everybody out. Not everybody, you know, like, like, you know, my, 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 my foot's in. God says, no, 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 no. Seeking first the kingdom of God is not about half of you being in. If you're going to seek first my kingdom, I want all of you in. I want you to run the spiritual play. I want you to follow me. I want all of your heart. I want you to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. God wants all of you. Central, no more hokey, pokey faith. Because you're missing out on all the good things God has for your life. And you never will experience them until you go all in with Jesus. Central, central, central. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you as well. Heavenly Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for your presence. Lord, today there's some spiritual decisions happening right now and I pray for many people, God. No more hokey pokey. We're going all in today. Father, I thank you right now that people are making spiritual decisions to run the play. Right now, people are making commitments to go to first step, to to be in church every weekend, to pray and read their Bible, to to serve on uh, one of the volunteer teams here at the church. God, I thank you that spiritual commitments are happening right now. We're going all in. Everything's more spiritual than we realize. And so, God, we choose to seek first your kingdom. And I thank you for blessing your people as they go all in. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's give it up big for Pastor Herbert. Come on. So good.
We will never be able to hear the hokey pokey the same again without thinking of our spiritual walk and our faith. Hey, just like Pastor Herbert was talking about, if you want to jump into First Step, you can do so out in our lobby. You can also go to Central on our Central.family, hit the quick link First Step, and you can sign up there. Hey, if you're new to Central, if, if, if you've just been coming in the last couple of months, we have an opportunity once a month called Coffee with the Pastors. And we have a Coffee with the Pastor opportunity this morning. You can head out to the new to Central area let them know that you want to join us. We'd love to have you come join me just for 30 minutes or so, get some free coffee and get a chance to meet you. So stop by Coffee with the Pastors and get back next weekend as we can kick off another great series. But between now and then, make sure you're holding on to Romans 8 that says, if God is for us, who could be against us? Keep showing up. We'll see you soon.